The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Our guest today, Samantha Abiel, is a 16-year-old author of a collection of prose and poetry entitled Reach for the Moon. She's joined by Charles R. Murphy, whose watercolor illustrations were the creative inspiration for Samantha's work. Charles and Samantha will be interviewed by Barbara Espenson, a Minnesota author of children's books. You know, when I go out to talk to children or other kinds of groups, I often call my presentation word magic because I think that this is what words do. It's astounding to me that you can take a normal, everyday bunch of words and put them together and something happens. And this is what you are doing with your book. I was <laughs> astonished when I read the first poem in the book. I was just amazed at the images that you came up with and the verbs. I'm, I tell children all the time, it's verbs that drive a poem. It's not so much adjectives, you know, you don't have to knock yourself out with adjectives, but you use marvelous verbs. You use lift and eddy and words that other people don't think of using in, and you use them in unusual ways. And I'm especially interested in that first poem. If you would read that. I'd love to. Okay. Pull it out here. It's called Wellspring. Yeah. And one of the questions that I had since um, Samantha has been doing this writing based on looking at poems that Charlie has done. And I'm wondering, there's a very, you want to hold that up? There's a very especially small, paintings, I mean paintings, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> watercolor paintings. It's a very you, small the painting. The poem here? Oh, it was yeah. one of his paintings. It, was it that small? Was it just a small painting? Uh, the, the wells Wellspring, yeah. Just uh, wellspring is not yeah, from one of my paintings. This yeah. is one that she's added okay. to the well, body. Okay, I'd like it. you to read Wellspring. Okay. Because it's it has, and I'd like those of you who are listening to us to listen for the verbs that Samantha uses because they're spectacular and it's what makes writing good. Go. Well, okay, the, I, have to, I have to kind of go back here. There's mm -hmm. sort of a story with this poem. All um, right, I, being a procrastinator that I am, that was... Uh, it was Sunday and I had an assignment due Monday <laughs> and I had absolutely no, I had no idea what to write. I had horrible writer's block and I was just pounding my head against the wall because I had no idea what to write. So, um, you know, I went for a walk with my mom and she told me something an artist friend had told her and she said, don't worry about it, you're just filling up the well. And I just thought that was an incredible I idea and concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, you know, and it was so, it's such a visual um, sentence. Mm -hmm. So I went back home and sat down at the computer and, and this poem sort of talks about what it's like to have writer's block. And, and what, um, you know, it's sort of regaining creativity. So here we go. Go well, for it. <clears throat> if you want to fill the well, make a boat out of paper. Set it on a dry and dusty riverbed, cracked and wrinkled like the face of a grandmother. Lie down on its fragile planks. Spread your hair over the edge like ivy to cling to the broken sand. Let your thoughts begin to trickle as if they were rain. Soaking your clothes and hair until you feel yourself begin to drift along on the current of ideas, like a leaf fallen on a river, spinning across reflections of the sky and eddying through the willows. Find the current below you, seeking its way into the ancient stone edifice of the well, pouring into its empty circle, just as love pours into an empty heart. The well becomes full, and your words are lifted in a bucket brought into the sunlight where the thirsty dip their hands in and drink. The astonishing thing about this poem to me is all of those wet words, all of those words that have only to do mm -hmm. with what water does. What made you think of, in the first place, a paper boat? 
I mean, I, so, you know, your mother tells <laughs> well, you, you that know, the well this, is going to yeah, fill up, but where yeah, did the this, paper boat come from? This poem was sort of a, you know, I, 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 li I like to draw from a lot of things that I've written before or, or from past things. And, and I had written a letter um, way back, I think, you know, a couple classes before this one on, um, it, was a, it had to be an, from an immigrant, and it took, you know, 1910, and it was sort of, a, just sort of an assignment that we had to do and turn in. And so I had talked about how this immigrant in the beginning had written um, this letter, and, and she described how her, how her pen was sort of like a boat on paper and I thought what an interesting concept to have your you know your paper sort of like water and the, and the pen sort of like a boat and and so I I thought that we you know the big really great thing to sort of incorporate when you're talking about things that have to do with water and refilling a well and and you know floating along and, and I think paper you know is such a neat concept because with writing that's that's the way you deliver things that's that's where your creativity ends up flowing I'm uh, interested in the fact that Charlie here has illustrated some of your poems, but that you looked at his watercolors mm -hmm. and something happened. I want to ask him, when you saw his the painting, if you can hold it up, the one that you're calling Quilt. Okay. If you find this one find here? It. Yeah, mm -hmm. no problem. Uh, this is a painting that I was very interested in when I saw it because it's a marvelous pattern. And I'm wondering, Charlie, when you did this painting, did you think of it as a quilt? I didn't think of it as a quilt, but the first thing that, that I wanted to do was stitch it together with this white line that you see uh, creating the grid pattern and unifying all the blocks and spaces mm -hmm. in the painting. And so where it wasn't a conscious uh, quilt making process, it was a segmented painting that was tied together by the thread and it, it took her words to put it together into the quilt image. And when when she was writing this poem, were, were you at your house and he was someplace else and then you showed it to him? This was a painting that she selected from some slides from an entire carousel. No wonder it's a marvelous painting. <laughs> uh, all of the choices, I'd like to point out that all the choices were made by her independent of me, mm -hmm. with the exception of pieces that I illustrated from her imagery. Mm -hmm. So there are a, a number of pieces here that uh, were done only after I read what she had written. Yeah. There, there is a piece that we both worked on mm -hmm. that it, it took a great deal of work on her part and then a little bit of comparison with what was going on on my end for this entire painting to come together. Is that one what once was white? Actually this one is if you, you want, want to see, see and it began here for you. as a, a painting that I wanted to incorporate Southwest colors and American Indian imagery mm -hmm. in. And Samantha had put together segments of the poem that is now finished. And she came and looked at the painting I was working on. Both her, her poem and my painting were in the uh, construction stages. And she went and worked on the poem independently and then came back to look at a painting for reference only to find out that I had destroyed the painting because it wasn't working. We thought we'd kill him. <laughs> oh my I didn't no, know, I didn't know we let him live. how to resolve the painting. Yeah. And since it wasn't working, I decided to destroy it and begin anew. Well then, after seeing the way she had structured her poem, the solution was in the way she orchestrated Good the heavens. poem on paper. And so, I began to work more from her written imagery after that. Uh, I was going to ask you, what kind of surprises has Samantha handed you? Several. In all this. <laughs> Several. Can you tell us about another? Is, are there, are there There's more? There's another bigger surprise. All it's right. it's Can a you piece tell us? called Come All the Old. And it's so charged with imagery. He always brings this one up. <laughs> that, well, it, it was the greatest <laughs> challenge of yeah, the book. Yeah, it was. Did this start with the painting or with the with, with the, the words. With the story, right? This one was, started oh, that's the story. entirely with her words. Mm -hmm. And it is so loaded with images that I thought, how can all this come together in a single picture plane? And then the, the real twist on it was this has to happen at night. And so it's one thing to portray all these figures and what they're up to uh, in daylight, but then under cover of night, you, you have an additional uh, creative problem and I, I'm very pleased with the outcome. Uh, Maybe, it was um, Samantha that issued the challenge to me, not me that created the, other way around. the challenge for myself. Maybe Samantha can tell us what, what it was that you were writing 
Tell us what that is. About. Oh, for the for the story for that, that mm -hmm. painting. Um, well, that that story was really an assignment in eighth grade, and and it was it really sort of talked about how, um, you know, I I had sort of seen all these things about um, you know people who are generally older and, and getting older, and, and I just thought it was such a neat concept that of you know having someone just sort of it's kind of like the Pied Piper, you know, mm -hmm. and the rats, and it's sort of a story about how this how this person sort of comes under the cover of darkness and and calls all these old people out of the village and and you know people who were who couldn't walk or who were very sick could could now um, sort of be rejuvenated by this by this by his music and mm -hmm. and um, were sort of let off and 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 were, were made happier. And why was this so hard to illustrate, Charlie? Well. First of all, because there were so many images, it, it's ripe with images, and which ones do you pick? Mm -hmm. And how do you bring them all together at the same time? Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a sort of uh, lineal fashion, you expect things to occur, and you could pick any one mm -hmm. of those to portray in your picture plane, but now I had all these things sort of happening simultaneously. So you're picking and choosing. Right, right. And each time you picked one, it sort of affected what had to happen mm -hmm. with the other one. Mm -hmm. And placement became critical. When I write, I really like to try to crawl inside and become what I'm writing. If we had a tree right here, and instead of just saying the bark is brown, the leaves are green, if you can crawl inside and become that tree, and you almost run out a checklist in your mind of, you know, what does the wind feel like? What are my roots doing in the ground? What are the birds doing above me? It adds so many more layers to what you're writing. And, we and should <laughs> bottle you and take you to all the creative writing courses across the world, <laughs> hey. because this is what we're trying to tell children all the well, time. You know, it's, it's so true and, and I think it was so neat because with Charlie's paintings they're so easy to sort of crawl inside and become his paintings and, and to, to sort of be the people and, and the objects in his paintings. I wonder uh, if you could read that self-portrait for us because that's, Certainly. that's a good way, that's exactly what you're saying in that self-portrait and it is you and it is how you work and I think this would be very interesting. Okay. Self-portrait. To show you who I am I crawled inside a tree became its roots, bark, and leaves, listened to its whispers in the wind. When fall came and painted the leaves red and gold, I wanted to shake them across your lawn, to transform the grass into a quilt, a gift to spread at your feet. But their numbers eluded me, so I turned a piece of paper into my soul to send to you so that you might see how easily it can be crumpled and flattened out again. I wanted you to see my resilience, but I wasn't sure how to arrange the numbers in your address. So I danced with the Indians in the forest and collected the feathers that fell from the eagle's wings, each one a wish for my future. But I lost track of their numbers, gathered too many, and was unable to carry them home. So I reaped the wind with my hair, lit its journey through my senses, and felt its whispered loneliness like lakes in winter. But it was too far and you could not follow me. Now I've written out their shadows like the wind collects its secrets, to whisper into receptive ears and I will leave them at your doorstep. A reminder of what others cannot see, a reminder of what I can and cannot be. Yeah, that is very, very nice. Thank you. I want to ask you about the picture. Did you do the illustration from her words? Then that was one that you just did for the book? Uh, that was a piece that was done. It was. Uh, the trouble with that one was it was unobtainable in, in the original form. Someone, most of these have been collected by individuals mm -hmm. and for the sake of putting the manuscript together we had to seek out the people that owned the original <sighs> painting so they could be professionally <laughs> yeah, photographed for the book and that was a piece that we had to recreate the painting uh, working from a slide so that we had it for publication. So it was a piece that was done, and she responded to it from the slide. You weren't writing, you didn't decide to write a self-portrait until you saw that painting? Um, well, it? actually, the self-portrait was, was written sort of without a painting. It was, it was written, um, the, the self-portrait poem, I, I was sort of the last poem that was ever put in the book, and that one um, was, was sort of, a, um, I don't know, it was, we didn't ever really find a painting to go with that mm -hmm. one. Um, the publisher was great. What they did is they, they were able to take pieces of some of the other paintings of Charlie's work and place them with that poem here in the book. But it's, mm -hmm. there wasn't a painting that went with that one, particularly. I'd like you to tell me a little bit about your so-called learning disability, okay. which is hard to, for me to, to hang on to. I must tell you that I, at one time, had a child when I was a third grade teacher who had never spoken to an adult at school. At home, I guess he's talked at home. His name was Jerry Pierce, and he is now, I think, 47 years old. 
and he didn't speak to me either. And we started to do a lot of creative writing and horsing around, messing around, throwing words on the board. And one day I was asking for words that meant the same thing as hot. And his hand went up and he was as though he had just exploded and you couldn't shut him up. And he mm -hmm. wrote and wrote and his stuff is in a book that I wrote a long time ago for teachers. It's some of the nicest things in there were by this little eight-year-old boy. It just opened him up, and I can understand this. So you cool. tell me now yeah. <laughs> how this happened. Um, well, I have a learning disability in math, and they call it dyscalculia, which means I have trouble telling time, adding, subtracting, multiplying, fractions, phone numbers, addresses, finding post office boxes, speed limits, anything mm -hmm. you can think of that has to do with numbers, I pretty much have a problem with. They're very difficult for me. Um, it's, it's sort of like having a minor case of Alzheimer's for me and the fact that one minute I'll, I'll know something and the next minute I'll have no idea. So mm -hmm. it's um, a real interesting thing. I still struggle with it. Um, every day there's you know all kinds of things that, that you have to deal with in life that involve numbers and they're very difficult for me. So. Do you know left and right? Do you have trouble <clears throat> that um, way? I have trouble with those, yep. I have trouble mm -hmm. with left and right. Grammar and um, spelling are very difficult for me. You could ask me right, right now what an adverb is and I couldn't tell you. Who cares? Um, yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing, and, and you sort of have to work through it. But that's another thing. Somebody who can write like you can write doesn't have to know no. what an adverb is. Somebody who's looking at your poetry can say, look how well she uses adverbs, and that you can point it out. But that is not what makes writing. Well, you know, it was so hard because I, I used to hate English. English, mm -hmm. I, oh, it was horrible. I hated it because all it was, you know, up until sixth grade was copying from the textbook. And mm -hmm. the textbook was just you were filling in misspelled words and grammar, and that's all it was. I mean, I can still see the cover of that grammar book. I mean, it scares me. It was horrible, and I, I used to dread English. And finally, in sixth grade, I had a teacher who passed out pictures from National Geographic, and she said, here, now, I want you to write a descriptive paragraph about these pictures. Uh -huh. And uh, the whole new world opened up. I, you know, I never realized that you could use writing to describe things. That was just <laughs> an incredible concept. I mean, the idea that the writing was more than, than grammar or spelling was, it was a really new idea. We used to tell, I used to tell our third graders, uh, just write it any old way. I'll, I'll be able to understand it. If you just tell me what this word says, I'll help you to spell it. And then later, we used the sixth grade paper mm -hmm. to write it out so that other people could see it. But I agree that you must let people run with it. It's like having a horse. Because yeah. I, had, I had an incredible teacher in seventh grade who um, would, was great and she would grade my writing on its content and ideas and not on its spelling or grammar which I mean if she had graded my, my writing on its spelling or grammar I would be here today I mean I probably would have been crushed and never would have written again because you know writing is so much more than, than that it's, it's um, what you're feeling and, and all that I think comes second it really does. Somebody that I cannot quote exactly um, said somebody asked this person why do you write and they said I write in order to see what I'm thinking and aren't you surprised when you get to the end of something that that's what you were thinking? Um, yeah, I am. Because I am. you it's, probably don't know when you, <laughs> when you write line one, I bet you don't know what line 20 is going to be. Oh, no. And, and no. you know, I usually just sort of have a vague idea of what that's I'm trying right. to get across, and that's about it. So yeah. it, it's surprising sometimes. <laughs> Between you and Charlie, who do you think has the most difficult and challenging job? You who look at a painting and write about it, mm -hmm. or Charlie who looks at the writing and illustrates it? Now, a lot of people illustrate people's books. Right. I mean, there are things called illustrators who illustrate books, and I've been very lucky. My books are stunning. I know writers, though, who pick up their book, and everything is a surprise to them, and sometimes they're not crazy mm -hmm. about what the artist saw. How have you worked together? I don't, I don't consider myself an illustrator, so mm -hmm. I don't think I have as difficult a time mm -hmm. as an illustrator would have. I consider myself a painter first, mm -hmm. and I paint uh, very freely uh, from music, like she writes from music, I, I paint with music as well, and a lot of free association goes on. Mm -hmm. And watercolor as a medium is extraordinarily fluid and tends to run off in directions that you can't even anticipate. So there's a degree of surrender there to the medium itself that uh, once you get used to it, you realize that this is always going to be the nature of the procedure and the constraints are not like they are in other mediums where every stroke must stand for something. Mm -hmm. You put down a stroke in watercolor and it takes off in many avenues. Same thing with her writing. I think somehow mm -hmm. magically this had to come together sooner or later. 
because her free association, her ability with words is as fluid as what I intend to do with mm -hmm. watercolor most times. Well, there's a poem in here that I love, mm -hmm. and it's called What Once Was White. And if you could hold the picture up, I could hold it up too, but I've got sure. a, a no sticker problem. on it. <laughs> yeah. Or here, I can hold mine up and you can read it. Oh, okay. I thought that, how's this? Okay, what well, once was white. Emptiness no longer prevails, her song has now begun. The harmony calls forth images as she weaves her melodic tune. His brush keeps frantic time. Sweeping the canvas, each note becomes a swirling color. What once was white is transformed, and a new world flows forth. Silver notes become strands of her hair, entwining fish which wave and weave among the brush strokes. Butterfly wings emerge from the treble clef, painting jewels upon her robe which shimmer like wet paint. A noble oak springs from the base clef, reaching in supplication for the tip of the brush. The canvas becomes a place where songs are pictures, and pictures are symphonies. Harmony and color combine, creating windows to a life within a life. Immortality swells with each note. Yeah, that's a marvelous, that's a marvelous collaborative thought. <laughs> because <laughs> she's telling you what you're doing, isn't right. that right? And in the illustration is a good uh, symbol, the flute music. Uh, we mentioned that we both work to music, and the mm -hmm. flute music is coming out and taking on a form. Yeah, yeah. You know, music is so important when it comes to writing. I, you know, I truly believe that music is the boat for the soul. And when it goes up in a wave, you go up with it. And when it goes down, you go down with it, too. And it's, it's incredible, the layers it adds. I just happen to have a question here <coughs> about this. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering, when you hear music, when you hear a particular kind of music, do you see something in your head immediately? Do you see pictures or do you see a, a line running? What do you see? I'll ask both of you okay. about this since I, you, you paint know, to music too. I see, I see pictures, I, I see images, it's, it's almost like a movie, you know, and you, you, see the, you can hear the soundtrack and you see the movie in your head, and that's, that's really what it's like for me when I hear music. Is it like a landscape with people in it? Um, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's something that, that is almost abstract and you can't really tell what it is. Sometimes it's, it's a very vivid image or it's, you know, it just depends on the, on the time of day or the mood or whatever's going on or whatever you're thinking. Do you so. see color in your head? Um, Sometimes, it just depends. <laughs> I really haven't thought about it. I don't know. I, I think sometimes I do. How about you now? When music, you when I listen to music to paint, first it's mood. The mood mm -hmm. starts, uh, there's no imagery involved mm -hmm. generally, and then the, the mood changes into a color, and then the color mm -hmm. changes into form, uh -huh. and then it all comes together as a, as, a, yeah. as a whole. But first it starts with the mood. Do you stand there with your watercolors and your easel and, or your large painting stretch, table stretch painting <laughs> stretch painting paper and think about it first or do you start moving your arm and dipping into color I do both of those things it all depends on once again mood what am I in the mood for do I have has the mood already evolved in my head into imagery or do I want to let whatever goes down first dictate to me what happens and that's why watercolor is my chosen medium because it's very spontaneous mm -hmm. and uh, we're, especially when you talk about what once was white as a title and mm -hmm. what, once what once was, was the white. title <laughs> of the, the title uh, we're of referring the book, yeah. to the blank page yeah. yes right and what once was white is now laden with words and therefore imagery and also with what painting was what, what once was white was the paper exactly yeah right. and the first stroke regardless of what <coughs> color it is, is the commitment to what follows. Now, uh, you saw that painting, Samantha? And, yeah. And did, the, did your work with that. So when you did that painting, what were you thinking? What music were you listening to? Maybe we'd like to uh, I was listening to some flute music uh, by Paul Horn okay. and uh, Jean-Pierre Rampal. Yes. I, I tend to look for certain pieces, uh, and also James Galway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have used James Galway's flute music in some of my, I teach uh, painting students, generally elder hostel and senior citizens. And I use flute music and other non, well, let me say instrumental music mm -hmm. uh, to stimulate an activity in painting, and usually in a timed exercise. But when you ask about specifically what music, it was flute it music. It was flute music. And 
what did you start with? What was your commitment to that? I began painting? with we the, look at the painting, right? exaggerated circular strokes that the music takes on as it flows from the flute. And what colors did you start blues, with? Blues, blues. You did? Very much so. It's yeah. nice to begin a painting with blues because... Why is that? Uh, it's very soothing and it's, it's somewhat non-committal. You can sketch out your negative in, in blue washes before you begin with mm -hmm. the more committed colors. I'm curious also about the painting that, that is the cover. Samantha, mm -hmm. can you turn that so sure. we can see that cover? Did you write a poem about that? I can't remember. Is um, yep, there's a poem that goes with this one. Do you want me to get the one in the book or the, the picture that goes with it in the book? I mm -hmm. can do that. That's probably a better painting. A re re reproduction of it here. Let's see if I can find it. This piece it. that you're referring to didn't have a title. It was, I, I take what great once was white? joy in attaching titles to my paintings. But uh, this piece that uh, you're talking about that was on the cover had no real title when I put the painting together. She had seen it shortly after it was Can conceived. you read, read what that p poem this says? Poem? Okay. Mm -hmm. Drawing the curtain of night. Crumple the day, shred the sunlight, scatter it into the sky. Summon clouds, shape into an alabaster mountain, then sculpt his benign and powerful features. Watch as with one hand he grasps the curtain of night, drawing darkness over the edge of the earth. In the hush, the world becomes still waiting expectantly for the moon to kindle the sky. Carefully, he suspends it amongst the stars, then stands back, appraising his work, before disappearing behind the curtain to wait for the whisper of sunlight. One of the things that's very hard for those of us who write poetry is to come up with a good last line. And I went through all of your poems, and I think your last lines are marvelous. They, they surprise us sometimes, they are really the end of the poem, and they're extremely satisfying. I'd like people who are watching us to listen to these verbs <laughs> that you used. Shred, crumple, drawing the curtain. You didn't say shutting. You said drawing it. Mm -hmm. You said uh, cloaking. You said kindle. You have an incredible addiction, <laughs> a healthy addiction <laughs> to words. This has been a marvelous opportunity for me. Um, I used to be a painter, I am now a writer, I, I'm inside both of you, mm -hmm. and I think we're all extremely lucky people. Well, this has been great, thank you so much. You're very this welcome. Great. You're yeah. very welcome. Reach for the Moon is indeed a result of an extraordinary collaborative and creative process. Thank you, Samantha Abiel, Charles R. Murphy, Barbara Espenson. Thanks to all of you for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency.